Welcome to the Sydney Town Hall and to the 2011 Human Rights Forum. It's fantastic to see such a great turnout tonight. I'm Indira Naidu, your host and moderator for the evening. Human rights currently sit high on the political agenda, both in this country and internationally. There must be genuine engagement with Aboriginal people and effective communication which recognises their right to self-determination between governments and Aboriginal communities on all issues affecting them. Our immigration and refugee policy must also be one that does not degrade, but rather dignifies, respects the dignity of those who claim our protection. This evening, the Commission has asked an eminent panel to discuss these and other key human rights challenges. We are honoured and delighted to have with us Her Excellency Navi Pillay, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. The Commission is also delighted to welcome Professor Patrick Dodson, a man who has inspired our quest for reconciliation in Australia. And Mr. Paris Aristotle, who has played a key role in seeking humane treatment for asylum seekers and in supporting victims, victims of torture and trauma. Well, I thought the way we would begin tonight is just to get to know our panellists a little better, hear their personal stories about how each one of them came to be involved in, in human rights advocacy. So first, if I could ask you, Navi Pillay, um, as a lawyer growing up in apartheid South Africa, I mean, it's pretty obvious that human rights was going to be on your agenda right from the beginning. Um, I began through, through the law. The law itself was immoral. Um, because it discriminated against black people and the judges were implementing these immoral laws and I decided I have to study further and look for human rights arguments to raise in the courtroom. Uh, Pat Dodson, if I could move on to you, is it possible to grow up as an Aboriginal man in Australia and for human rights not to touch you every day, the issues around it? I think it's pretty impossible. Uh, I. Uh grew up before the 67 referendum when we were reckoned in the numbers to be counted for the determining of representation in the parliament, House of Reps. So we weren't even citizens when I was growing up. And, and Paris Aristotle, what was the defining moment for you? When did you decide that you were going to become an advocate for torture victims? The first person I ever worked with was a Latin American woman who um, described her story, her, her husband and others, their house was raided, people were beaten up and she was knocked unconscious and uh, when she came to her husband and one of her sons was dead and she said to me, we're not victims of a natural disaster of any kind, we're, we are victims of the human hand and we don't seek pity, we seek justice. And that was a pretty good reason for me to stick with this. And so that six month um, job that I thought would be good to start off with has turned into mm. 24 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Navi Pillay, if I can ask you, given your global perspective, why do you think, given the very small numbers of um, asylum seekers um, that arrive in Australia, Australia struggles with this issue and treats it as, as a crisis it's not really. Why do you think that is? I come here to remind the government of its international obligations, that it is accountable for implementing the obligations it has undertaken, that it calls upon other countries to implement. So the standards that have been set... <laughs> People who come to Australia to seek asylum do not lose their human rights. They're entitled to those human rights. Now, the other um, policy issue that the current government's grappling with is how we process the asylum seekers. The first option should not be how best to turn away people. The first option would be how to receive people. Um, And 
if, if, uh, if Australia is serious about this policy of sending uh, 800 people out to Malaysia, then I think it uh, violates the uh, refugee law. They cannot send uh, individuals to a country that has not ratified the torture convention, the convention on refugee, refugees. So there are no protections for uh, individuals in Malaysia and of Australia, of all people that upholds the standards internationally, should not be, collaborate with these kinds of schemes. And, and how are you going to be as frank as this or more frank when you talk to our leaders about these issues? Let me say, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, this mandate was given to me by all, by all 192 states, including Australia. Now that, that's the first thing I remind them. You gave me this job, now let me do this job. If I can move on to another issue and, and bring in our other panellists here too, another area you feel very strongly about is, is the intervention and there are now moves um, potentially to expand that into Alice Springs. What are your views about the intervention? Let me say I got a better sense about the intervention when I landed here uh, and met with uh, almost 40 uh, leaders of communities and they came in from all the remotest parts of the Northern Territory uh, and they say that the intervention has made their life worse instead of better. So why would you have a, a special measure called intervention if it is not to the advantage of the people? Uh, this policy does not work. It hasn't been consented to. It was never discussed and considered with the Indigenous peoples and whenever they've raised their voices they've been deemed and vilified as pedophiles or some sort of deviant or having other motives. We've got to create the new relationship, the new partnership and go forward. And that requires the recognition of the Indigenous peoples as the first peoples or the first nations of this country. I just want to quickly um, touch upon, and maybe um, Paris can start this um, for us, on some global human rights issues. Um, and one of them um, recently, uh, which, which goes into the legality of, of um, our counter-terrorism issues, is the killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, I wonder if um, the panel has any views about the legality of that and whether um, counter-terrorism should still respect international law. If you walk away from legal instruments, it becomes impossible to draw the line uh, because you can always come up with the next justification. But if I do torture this person, if I do assassinate that person, I may well save 10,000 other lives. You can always find a way. Where do you stop? Do you say, I'm just going to torture that person or I'm just going to assassinate that person? Or do you say, yeah. perhaps I can to also torture their wives or their children or their family members because it's still part of this notion of protecting the greater good. Once we head down that track, I think we're in serious trouble and that's what concerns me about that. Hmm. Terrific. OK, well, now that we've opened up a few of those issues, what I'd like to do now is take some questions from the floor. In regards to the treatment of asylum seekers and those in detention in Australia, um, and if we could just maybe clarify what's conventions or obligations are being breached by, by Australia um, in, in regard to that context, and also perhaps what can be done um, on a more practical scale to counter the complacency perhaps that the Australian um, electorate may be, um, may be feeling towards these issues. Having come now and seen uh, how wrongly it's being implemented in practice, I will be working together with my colleague, the High Commissioner for Refugees, in really urging Australia to respect the norms and standards that it uh, subscribes to by ratifying these international statutes. All these bodies, including the Human Rights Council, have urged Australia to uh, redress the violations arising from its treatment of asylum seekers. If you paint a group of people coming to Australia as a faceless horde of invaders that may be terrorists and run a poll in the Herald Sun or whatever, you will of course get 95% saying don't let them in. But my personal view is that if you took a mother and her children off that same boat and put them in front of that same group of Australian people, a very high percentage of them will say, oh, we don't mean them. And that's the challenge that we've got here. 
All the reservations of the United Nations and many Indigenous Australians on the topic of the Northern Territory intervention are well known. But the federal opposition now appear to be seeking support for a second intervention into the lives of Indigenous people. What can the United Nations and other concerned Australians do to prevent this? Surely Australia has got some other ways of dealing with the issues that may give rise to the sentiment for an intervention. After all, the social degradation that exists has come about because of policies in the past, poor strategies, the lack of recognition and the slow attempt to seriously recognise the uniqueness of the Indigenous peoples as equal citizens, as equal in this system to anyone else. And we won't be able to deal with them unless there's a serious interface and interaction, negotiation with the Indigenous peoples about how and what it is they want to see interventions around and what it is they're prepared to consent to and with the restoration of their own rights to land and their own dignity. Thank <clears throat> you.